Good evening, sir. Yeah, yeah. I think you are audible. Am I audible to you? Uh, I think I am experiencing a certain lag. Uh, if you could just say something. Okay. How is this? Um. Uh. Yeah. Still a lag? Yeah. I think it's better now. Yeah. Uh, um. Could we try your phones, maybe? Or, uh, okay. Okay. Um. Yeah, me. Okay. I'll just I I'll just check once again. Is this better? Um, better now? Yeah. I can suddenly uh, hear you. It must be much better. Okay. I was just trying to balance the phone. <laughs> That's always a task. Okay. Paperweight or something. Anyway. So, I can hear you now. Thank you. Um, yeah. So uh, let's begin with a quick introduction of the session. Uh, today we're uh, discussing the topic of um, going beyond a technological understanding of technology based on uh, uh, Professor Kamath's article in the EPW. Um, allow me to quickly introduce our speaker for the evening today. Uh, Anand Kamath is an assistant professor at the National Institute of Advanced National uh, Studies, uh, Bangalore, uh, associated with the Inequality and Human Development Program at the NIAS. Uh, he studies the sociology of technology uh, in India with special interest in the subaltern. Concerns on inequality, urban transition, uh, social mobility, spatiality, gender, and caste. Undergird his inquiries on technological experiences and outcomes. He is co-author of Urban Undesirables, City Transition and Street-Based Sex Work in Bangalore, 2022, Cambridge University Press, and author of The Social Context of Technological Experiences, 2020, Toothledge, and Industrial Innovation Networks and Economic Development, 2015, Toothledge, besides several other research articles. He completed his PhD at United Nations University, Sash Merit, the Netherlands and has studied at the Center for Development Studies, uh, Trivandrum, Nidra School of Economics, uh, Chennai, and uh, St. Joseph's College, Bangalore. A very, very warm welcome to you, sir. Thank you. It's a great privilege to speak to EPW. It's lovely to have you, sir. Um, to, to start off with, uh, in your article for EPW, you explain why a sociological and political understanding of technology is necessary. Uh, could you elaborate on this further? Oh, yeah. Um, in fact, I've worked several years on the theme, and uh, <clears throat> I'm certainly not the first or the most significant contributor to the theme. It's been there for several decades. Uh, there have been feminist scholars who have contributed to it, historians who have contributed to it. The whole point is that anything you see around you, I would say anything, even the pen that's next to you, the headphones that you're using, they're as much infused with political and sociological variables as they are with the science and technology that makes them. The, the idea is that things have politics and power mm -hmm. deeply embedded within them. Take anything, it's the case. In fact, uh, even, uh, even if you see the chairs that you and I are sitting on and the chairs that many of our viewers are sitting on, mm -hmm. actually, the, uh, I would use the Hindi word for it and forgive those who don't, forgive me if you don't speak Hindi for those in the audience, but uh, the Hindi word for it is kursi. Right? Mm -hmm. And it's very, a very power laden word, isn't it? So that's there. And it's not just about the semantics. It's not just about the vocabulary. It's about the fact that a chair is a very political thing mm -hmm. in a certain context. So technologies and artifacts are never neutral. And if they're not neutral, so are not the processes that create them, that distribute mm -hmm. them, that use them. Now, let's take a few technologies, for instance. If you take the, one of the most classic technologies that are there in the literature, a motorcycle. It's mm -hmm. uh, not only it's not only one of the proxies for uh, for masculinity it, to express your masculinity. Absolutely, it's, 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 there's so much uh, there's so much uh, sociology and politics in it. You take take a sewing machine for instance. When it's at home, it's something that your grandma or your mother uses. Mm -hmm. Whereas when inside in a shop, it's always a male tailor, mm -hmm. right? It's mm -hmm. a professional device, and professional devices are only for men, not for your grandma at home. Uh, you take factory labor. If you take anything, so people's interactions with technologies, the way people look at them, depend on their sociological coordinates and mm -hmm. their 
in the grander scheme of things. Now, even if you take the macro picture, macro technologies, for example, I mean, there's no such word as macro technologies. It just came out of my mouth now. But even if you take macro technologies like, say, big dams, uh, nuclear power, and so on, these are greatly influenced by what we think of as a nation itself, right? Mm. These are not there because they are the best technologies or they're great technologies. Uh, dams, for instance, were very much a, not just a technology, but also a, a nation building project. It was an ideology. Mm -hmm. yeah, but same case with anything. So the public understanding, the commonplace public understanding of what technology even is, is mm -hmm. influenced by these things. So this is not just about the vernacular meanings of technology across space and across culture. It is greatly about even an individual's association. So if we need to make our understanding of technology more fine-grained, and if we need to properly think of policy interventions and any other kinds of interventions, we need to factor in a sociological and a political understanding into the technology around us. So that's why, to answer your question, a sociological and political understanding of technology is necessary. If I am mm. Yeah. And to quote uh, directly from your article, you say that scholarly work has demonstrated a more fine grained understanding that the stuff of technology is not just science and engineering, but also sociology and politics. Yes, yes. It's one of those guiding uh, guiding sentences which defined, me, defined a lot of my work from my PhD on the stuff of a technology is Absolutely. so much hidden with power, it's so laden with social, it's so laden with power. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So it's not just key to investigate our algorithms, but also the social meanings that we attribute to technology itself. Uh, it's, rather, it's rather late in the day, but I'm only now reading uh, this Weapons of Math Destruction. It's a wonderful book. Uh, ah. a, lot of, a, a, a lot of my contemporaries have already read it, and I'm the last person to read it. But it's, it, it shows how even an algorithm is actually what she says is it's, it's, uh, it's basically... Uh, 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 it's, you know, it's basically an ideology in disguise, mm. an ideology. Mm. In disguise. I mm. thought that that was a fair statement, so I'm going to use it. Mm. In my but the point Absolutely. is, that as neutral as an algorithm, when you say it, mm. is basically ideology in mathematical disguise. Mm. So Absolutely. that's what. Uh, so you also write that there are certain contradictions and complications in the technological experience, and could you break that further down for us? Okay, um, so what I said earlier is that, you know, one of the most consistent findings in science, and this is not my statement, it comes from the scholarly literature, one of the most fi consistent findings in all of social science is that who you are and uh, who you know uh, determine how you, how, how you do, all right? Now, that can be extended to technology as well. Who you are, where you're from, determine greatly how you engage with the technology. And that's the whole point when you ask about contradictions and complications. And that's a pretty huge point because even the both of us speaking, uh, we come from well, visibly different genders. Uh, we come from visibly different backgrounds, not just in terms of region, cultural backgrounds and so on. We come from visibly different. The only thing possibly in common is, you know, the language we speak and so on. But sure. the point is that so therefore, exactly the same thing what we're doing now, looking into a phone, will depend greatly on, on your social coordinates. So if you're, for instance, if you're, if you're upper caste uh, or a middle upper class, if you belong to a privileged gender and so on, you will deal with anything, not just a phone, you'll deal with anything differently from those who come from disadvantaged intersections. And one need not be completely disadvantaged. One can have, you can be at the cross sections of being an upper caste uh, unprivileged gender uh, of, of a middle class and so on. Each one of those coordinates will de determine how you deal with the technology. So that's where it becomes extremely complicated. Mm -hmm. uh, so yeah. if I pass, I mean, the easiest thing I can tell you is a mobile phone. Because, you know, if I pa pass this in, a, in say, a class of 50 students, mm -hmm. each, when it goes to each person's hand, it becomes a different mobile phone because each person has a different set of sociological and, and political coordinates. And that's where it, so it's not just about it's, it's, it's so when I say that your sociological coordinates and your position in the grand scheme of power and in, uh, in, in society determines it. It's not just just a black and white thing of whether the technology is beneficial to you or not. Mm -hmm. It's not that whether your sociological combinations, whether they will allow you to extract the benefits the most, will they allow? Mm -hmm. you to do that? 
not just in in mobile phones with anything even with a pen will mm -hmm. uh, your sociological combinations will your sociological coordinates be able to get help you get the best of the pen so mm -hmm. it same time let me not say it's all gloom and doom for those who belong to all the unprivileged sociological variables uh, you know you belong to the wrong caste and the wrong class and the wrong it's not about that the point is even even in disadvantagedness there can be novel ways of doing things and uh, this is not to romanticize disadvantagedness certainly not but to argue that uh, a certain type a certain section of sociological and political variables in a person uh, uh, you know might actually end up being the right platform to bring something new and one of those uh, an example of that and many people are wondering can you give an example of that an example of that is grassroots technologies they can never come from uh, people who have the you know the most advantage sociological attributes right, right. so you, you, they, it, they 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 usually created in a situation of disadvantage again Absolutely. this is not this yeah. is not advantage is good but still your disadvantage can make you look at even a successful quote unquote successful technology in a different way but mm -hmm. it can also be a platform to get out new technologies which affluent people cannot so it's really complicated as you can see even my answer i think was very winding uh the point is you never know what comes out you never know so like you can do all the market research you want mm -hmm. you can do all there is you can do all the background research you want and finally when mm -hmm. it goes it going to looks like like mm -hmm. uh, so that's why it's really complicated and uh, that that's why it's also quite uh, exciting to study absolutely absolutely i really like your example of how you ha you can hand uh, 50 mobile devices to 50 different individuals and each one's experience will be different um for some it might be rendered useless because uh, they have a phone but they don't have connection to the internet perhaps um and uh, good quality internet at that and then that completely alters your experience so and we saw that during the pandemic we saw it quite often where um there were video calls happening for online classes but um that takes huge amounts of good internet to actually be able to listen to what the teacher is saying or you just keeps uh, you know breaking off and you can't really learn much from the lecture or how much of a safe space you have to actually do the class and not do your household uh, right tasks instead right. so yeah. all of those things really alter the experience of technology uh so uh how has the impact of technology um been socially differentiated and why digital technology portends alienation control and exploitation for the marginalized groups instead of expanded agency uh, could you explain with a few examples so if i've got the question right you're asking me about how uh, is it how is it how how, how do new technologies bring about alienation control exploitation I've got mm. that right. Yeah. So, yeah. Um, in the in some of the research that I have done, I've looked at again back to mobile phones. Um, uh, I've looked at how, how mobile phones are used by the communities, by power karmikas, and for those who don't understand that, power karmikas are civic workers who well treat mm. um, okay. phones among them, and most of them are female, uh, mm -hmm. and also among the rather large cohort. Um, the it's. quite incredible it's not just about uh, it's it's not just that uh, you know they, they it's it's not just that they don't know how to use them or know how to use them. it's not something as black and white and so mental as that the point is their experiences are extremely complicated uh among dalit communities the 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 the, uh, the 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 use of the mobile phones was very very complicated in terms of what they could and could not do and what suddenly It, it it some of those things really hit them like a ton of bricks the fact that now they have more surveillance there's more hate against uh, them and that hate is mm -hmm. circulating very fast uh, okay. among our karmikas they suddenly realized that uh, not 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 just mobile phones they had that biometric system suddenly they realized that they are the mercy of these machines and the fact that they the, the fact that they're women uh, the fact that they're mostly women put them at a great disadvantage with their male colleagues who don't need to do the sweeping you see mm -hmm. so they the far more uh, the male the, the male workers fingerprints who don't have to do most of the sweep have far clearer fingerprints and so on whereas in an in the case of these ladies their fingerprints were quite um, uh, you know smudged and so on and of course with sex workers you know it, it is just tremendous uh, both the exploit uh, 
the empowerment days agency all that was uh, was 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 uh, you know quite accentuated so in our in our more commonplace experience the experience of aadhar the experience of uh, moving of being forced to move to digital platforms in the during the demonetization experience mm-hmm. uh, the, the the whole uh, initial roll out of the covid vaccine <clears throat> they are all highly telling of how mm-hmm. if you belong to the wrong uh, social groups you could be even more alienated than before mm-hmm. <clears throat> while of course there would have been complications in in the past in um, in um, uh, say doling out the polio vaccine and so on this was a kind of alienation that you know has never been seen before that is the covid vaccine <clears throat> alienation same way it's only too well known that artificial intelligence has a very high likelihood of replacing jobs and especially mm-hmm. jobs right down below the value chain and especially for female in formal labor so there you go again that something that we are glorifying these days something that we are valorizing actually mm-hmm. will create even greater control exploitation and alienation for marginalized groups even new even entirely new job sectors such as gig economy jobs and so on are embedded within technological structures that are deeply are, have deeply unequal power relations so when mm-hmm. power embedded in technology then that power is handed over those power structures are handed over to the beneficiary of the sector is also and immediately you have issues of surveillance personal data social filtration policing mm-hmm. pd forwarding of dangerous information all that in fact uh, in immediately uh, you know these, these things are invoked Mm-hmm. i would even go so far as to say that the very existence of matrimonial sites is uh, something that has alienated quite a lot of people who would like to break caste right, right. today is the right day to talk about it and uh, you know, absolutely the best way to get rid of caste is to break the whole thing altogether rather than you know, mm-hmm. and uh, mm-hmm. the very existence of things like matrimony matrimony sites only emboldens caste further so absolutely what is that see the path of te- technological evolution if i can use the pythagorean the, the path of technological evolution is not is rarely about which are the best rational choices it is mm. about which are the irrational sociological structures that mm. are the <clears throat> so when yeah. you choose between technology a b c d e most of the time it is not rational economic choices that there were such uh it's not that that is that is uh, determining it but much more irrational social so what happens is to cite uh, you know uh, to cite a, a, a phrase from the literature by lawak what one that technological modernity for many marginalized groups is nothing but the modernization of their misery okay that's mm-hmm. why their whatever alienation and control and exploitation these marginalized groups have had for a long time in history just become modernized but let me repeat that it may not always be a tragedy there might be surprising creative experiences perhaps new avenues for collectivization and so on so it's not always gloom and doom but then i mean your question is very pertinent so let me just uh, yeah let me just uh, end my answer there yeah yeah very 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 well put so um i think uh, when we continue to have such conversations we should also keep on asking that technology but technology for whom and progress but progress at what cost hmm. um, so you also mention uh, the jam uh, uh, scheme and uh, your concerns around uh, technology you, and well being you mean or you mean jam then or other yeah 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 i said jam okay huh. yeah yes, yes. Yeah. Uh, and could you um, and, and the i'll just repeat my question You yeah, also sure, mentioned sure. jam and your concerns around technology and well-being that we need to focus on. Do you think that the two are inherently incompatible in the way that technology is being deployed in society today? Is there a need to reimagine tech-related schemes? So, I, I, use, I mean, does the question suggest that do you think that technology and well-being are um, that? Do I think that technology and well-being are incompatible? Well, well. First of all, let me just say that I'm I'm not an expert commentator on the Jandan Aadhaar mobile thing. In my article, I was I, I mentioned it because I was concerned mm-hmm. about upside its uh, priorities, right? Sure. So uh, I wish I had it, but I didn't. Uh, 
so see as far as we are uh, just like we have discussed it so far there's no strict incompatibility between right? mm -hmm. it's not that they are incompatible i am no pessimist but at the same time that my problem is with the fact that the default position is a guaranteed compatibility right it, it's not far fetched at all if you look at policy documents if you look at new policies and schemes and programs not only from the central government but also from various other bodies that uh, are in charge of these things are, are engaged with these things there seems to be a default position that there is a guaranteed compatibility between technology and well being and that is what i have a problem with so i'm not saying that an incompatibility but i have a problem with this guaranteed compatibility notion and that is the tone and the vocabulary of the over digitization of everything mm. and the problem is very little of all the complexities we have talked about so far are appreciated or accounted for in policy things critical realities like caste and the realities of gender are given just a passing mention just for the report to look good I and mean, for the policy to look good they just given a passing mention in the general policy conversation about technology and development it seems almost that we have assumed caste to have become irrelevant when we talk about tech mm. when we talk about technology and labor when we talk about technology and development caste is not there not because they don't know about it it's because they feel that it is not something that it doesn't make the conversation look good i mean you're talking about ai you're talking about nanotech you're talking about all these wonderful things and caste is something that just dirties the whole thing whereas Absolutely. actually the structure of it mm -hmm. so we have to ask ourselves that is do we want smart cities smart cities and smart citizens or do we want to you know empowerment and dignity what do we mm -hmm. want our tech to do for us exactly we need data technological priorities clearly are the technologies being the priorities or what are the priorities more genuine imaginaries of development if though if our priorities are about empowerment and dignity and if our priorities are about i mean if our priorities are about using technologies for empowerment and if our priorities are about are about very genuine imaginaries of development and well being certainly technology and well being are very compatible it can they can be made to be compatible so let me just cite from uh you know great philosopher of technology who happens to be still alive and rufinberg who said that mm -hmm. the fate of a society is bound to its understanding of technology not he didn't say deployment mm -hmm. he didn't say mm -hmm. how he said to our how do we understand technology that's the that that will determine the fate of and in a society that is so complicated in terms in in terms of you know whatever we in india in the context of inequality in the context of subalternity these contexts uh, are very highly applicable to the giant portion of india's people inequality subalternity so if mm -hmm. that's the case then the of the fate of our society greatly depends on how we even understand technology right so if you want technology and well being to be uh, compatible i guess we'll have to just have priorities straight and then they will be they will very much be compatible right uh, so how does one steer clear from that technocratic understanding of technology and yet not fall into pessimism about the role of technology in labor and development oh yeah okay how how do you stay clear from techno technocracy yeah. um well more research definitely um peek mm. in the media um better public understanding of technology um, more, more inclusion of civil society in technological decisions and policy crafting mm. uh, and more types of technological engagement than how the technocracy thinks about it so what we need for instance in academic research is more enmeshing of social soci sociology and technology it's mm -hmm. there i would say it's not there but it's certainly not enough and certainly not enough in india there's mm -hmm. a lot there's a lot of work done in the west among uh, say in the united states among black communities among women and so on but it's not been there in india as much as it should be despite us being a treasure trove of inequality and uh, you know subalternity now um we need to really build a strong, stronger community of scholars looking at this mm -hmm. but let me say one thing and it's not because we have got this platform but uh, let me just say that actually epw has done a fantastic job of uh, moving away from highly technocratic technology uh, mm -hmm. i put in a chapter in a book that i wrote in 2015 in 2020 that um, i i surveyed about what 50 years almost of epw articles week by week and i looked at how they looked how several articles looked at um looked at the idea of technology itself and 
although my although I had mentally been prepared for the worst, I actually saw that uh, the kind of articles that EPW carried for the last forty whatever years were were, were were very very not anti technocracy but departing from that typical technocratic understanding. So I was very very pleased to see that uh, movement away from you know very deterministic uh, inclinations. We sometimes thank you, sir. sometimes and thank you for that kind of observation. It's a very important because EPW mm -hmm. is a uh, in, in Indian academia, so it's I, I can I mean I've, I've written this in a chapter. You can see it. See, sometimes sure. we, we need to steer clear. If we need to steer clear from a highly technocratic thing, we have to sometimes even recalibrate our definition of a definition mm -hmm. of innovation. That we need to move away from technology as defined as an instrument of modernity. to technology as agency okay our current conceptualization of technology in the mainstream unfortunately is too economic it is too affluent it is too mm -hmm. homogenized okay mm -hmm. what we need to do is we need to broaden out our what what we think of technology mm -hmm. what do we even what do we consider as knowledge in the first place okay we even need to broaden out how we even create the idea of aspiration itself you know when but see the idea of what is a good life is something that has been fed to us from from all around us now if we improve the quality of what is fed around us naturally our improve our very idea of what to aspire itself improves mm. so we move away from these stupid tactile imaginaries of device modernization and you know this great visual pageantry of you know big glass buildings and everybody connected to the internet we need to move not move away but i'll say that not restrict to that we need to move towards more genuine technological uh, imaginaries mm -hmm. where things like social justice, where things like dignity where things like excellence where things like enhancement uh, come to the forefront of our thinking come to the forefront of our aspirations all right and i think again let me say today 14th uh, april is possibly the best day to think about these things yes brilliantly said sir um so how would uh... technology strategy strategies be oriented towards genuine modernity uh, where dignity and equal rights are foregrounded okay um basically what do we do well i'll i'll just say that well to start with a greater role of civil society especially among organizations working particularly on technology and particularly among the disadvantaged um they if, if those kind of groups could be empowered with more funding and more freedom to work Uh, well, as far as funding and freedom to work goes, I think I must also speak of my own friend. So uh, we, you know, we need far more attention on these things. Um, how much do we speak of the marginalised as stakeholders and as contributors when we even talk about technology and development? Just look back at all, all the commonplace conversations, whether in parks and bus stands or in trains or in your homes or in television debates or wherever you see it. How much do we speak of the marginalised in this? as stakeholders mm -hmm. it does not not just as passive recipients that's easy that's the that's the, you know technological charity is the easiest thing to do all you mm -hmm. need is all you need is the cash and you know it's not very difficult to do that but how do you do you consider them as contributors to the whole idea of technology and development so what we need to do is when we look at policies programs and schemes we need to do sociological assessments of them to see how much the marginalized have become stakeholders in it okay mm -hmm. now Uh, if i can just take a minute i'll say that you know i i i'm associated with the equality and human development program at at the national academies where i where i work and here one of the components of our inequality and human development program is on unpacking the complexities of technological experience in the context of inequality in the context of economic distress so we in the program are looking at how these technologies and how our understanding of these of technological experience can be oriented towards the empowerment and wellbeing so we are doing work like this and i i i really hope more people are doing work like this the thing is that technocratic establishments are usually i would say not unconcerned but indifferent about such groups because for them and in my personal experience of, of speaking to them also for them technology is technological so framework of frameworks of empowerment equity justice and all that it is that that needs to steer the the discourse around technology mm. because, well because technology is more than the technology mm. like absolutely we have an audience member asking a question sure. on similar lines and uh, 
they say uh, how how does one steer uh, the less privileged actually towards technology and its positive aspirational benefits i wish that were easy to answer because if we knew the answer we would have done it already um mm-hmm. thing is that look at the kind of uh, well, you know the, uh, it is it is very much pos- possible to expose marginalized groups to what technology can do i'm not saying that in a patronizing way that is we need to educate them that's not what that's not what i'm saying but um you know to to tell them that for example to, to 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 demonstrate to them and so on and civil society plays a great role in this to demonstrate mm-hmm. to demonstrate to them for instance that something like this device can be used for so much more than entertainment and so much more than just quick messaging to friends and relatives and so on uh, mm-hmm. because those are the kind of things that a lot of affluent affluent individuals and social groups are doing they're using this for the betterment of uh, of their lives and their livelihoods sure. and not because they have any gray matter up here it's because they're in they're in a status of privilege so they're able to mm-hmm. that that immediately turn to the technological engagement world. so i think a good amount of exposure okay let me get that word straight exposure not teaching right? exposure mm-hmm. uh, will really help you know what 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 uh, what the person well the other thing is also to take on board you know their ideas of technology what do they even consider this thing as it's it's, it's a part of the work that even we are doing in the ihc program uh, what do they even consider as technology in the first right? that, mm-hmm. that will help us understand also how we can uh, help marginalized groups better and enrich their technological engagements by understanding what they even they mean by technology in the first place absolutely um so uh, i think with that we can call a wrap on this session um for all those tuning in um if you're interested uh, please feel free to read uh, professor kamath's article it's very much available on our website and as a small side note i would also request you at this point to subscribe to epw and uh, follow us and support us on our social media channels um and a very very big thank you to all those who tuned in so patiently a uh, very 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 big thank you to uh, professor kamath for all his incredible insights i'm sure that uh, we will leave with a radically different <laughs> um version of uh, our understanding of technology um and, and and there are so many takeaways from this session and um we should always interrogate how to actually like professor kamath says build genuine modernity for our workforce for our economy for our society um uh, and, and understand that technology is socially embedded it's it's a very loaded term at the end of the day so thank you thank you for your time sir okay thank you i'm i'm not a full professor but thank you very much uh, <laughs> for all your people who joined in uh, yeah thank you very much for this interaction it's been a great, a great... thank you bye bye goodbye